everyone, and thank you for signing into our presentation on nanobubbles and wastewater treatment. I'm Peter Bug, Director of Water and Wastewater Treatment at Moliere. I've been working in various aspects of water and wastewater for over 30 years with an emphasis on new technologies. I remember over 30 years ago talking to a plant operator about using UV instead of chlorine and getting a very puzzled look when I suggested we would be putting a bunch of light bulbs in their effluent stream. That technology, of course, is now very commonplace. Today, we will be discussing nanobubbles, which are at that early stage of discovery and applications. From the studies we have done to date, I believe nanobubbles will provide you a new and exciting way to improve wastewater treatment and truly is a game changer. With oxygen transfer efficiencies of greater than 84%, or by lowering the oxygen energy requirements by as much as 60%, which we will discuss shortly. But first, let me tell you a little bit about who we are. Moliere is a manufacturer of industrial scale nanobubble generators founded just over five years ago in Los Angeles, California. Shortly after that start, Moliere launched our first nanobubble generator. We quickly learned that there were endless applications and opportunities for nanobubbles and quickly started working with recognized universities, researchers, and global experts to help us validate and understand what values and benefits nanobubbles can provide. Today, utilizing our patented technology and growing understanding of the applications of nanobubbles, we design and build a variety of systems in Los Angeles for distribution all over the world. Polyair is currently active in the application of nanobubbles in various markets, including the food market, such as horticulture and specialty crops, where nanobubbles increase crop yields, or aquaculture, where nanobubbles reduce oxygen costs in salmon farms by as much as 70%, or for food safety, where nanobubbles can replace chlorine for food sanitation. We work in water where nanobubbles can eliminate algae and surface water or an in industrial and municipal wastewater treatment where we can reduce energy consumption by as much as 75%, making an impact on lowering CO2 emissions or the natural resources markets where we can increase oil production from aging wells by 50 to 90% or reduce costs in recycling produced water. I could go on, but let's focus on nanobubbles and wastewater for the moment. So what exactly is a nanobubble? Our nanobubbles are roughly 100 nanometers in diameter or 0.1 micron, putting them in the size of viruses or colloidal silica. The size is about 10 to the sixth of a fine bubble. And as I mentioned, similar to colloidal particles, we find that nanobubbles act very much like colloidal particles in the water. Our common perceptions of bubbles don't apply when trying to understand the characteristics, reactions, movement, and interactions of nanobubble. Please allow my colleague, Dr. Federico Pizzini, to further explain how nanobubbles behave and what benefits we achieve with them. Hi, I am Federico Pizzini. Together with the team of application and research and development engineers, we advance our understanding of nanobubbles using cutting edge laboratory equipment and collaboration with university research partners. We investigate how to produce them, their properties of surface charge and oxidation, their ability of transfer and of store gas into a liquid, their effect on surface tension, and their interaction with polar molecules, and much more. Our, our mission, apply our knowledge to each industry application to find green, low energy, and cost-effective solutions. At Moliere, we apply standard methods as well as innovative procedures, such as nanoparticle tracking analysis, Zeta potential analysis, spectrophotometry, surface tension analysis, water chemistry, biological analysis, and much more. A few key findings so far showed us how uh, Moliere technology can inject up to billions of nanobubble of nanometer sized nanobubble per milliliter of liquid. Each nanobubble has high internal pressure and a shell of ions, which is absorbed on the surface of the bubble. This makes each bubble electrically charged very much like a coagulant or a surfactant. We discovered that now bubble produce uh, oxidative effect by releasing hydroxyl radical when stressed or when uh, induced to collapse. We know that nanobubbles interact with polar molecules such as surfactant and modify the surface tension of a liquid. We know that nanobubbles prevent the formation of biofilm and algae on surfaces and dramatically reduce the proliferation of bacterial colonies in a liquid. We also know that nanobubble participates with the kinetic of oxygen and nutrient uptake in plants and bacteria. The ability of Moliere technology of producing high concentration of stable nano-sized bubbles was validated by an independent laboratory, which found nearly a billion nanobubbles per milliliter in a liquid. 
Data showed how nanobubbles were stable in the liquid for long periods of time and had neutral buoyancies. This is because their size. An independent validation performed by Professor Stanstrom from UCLA, a world leader expert in aeration technologies, concluded that Moliere technology provides efficient, low energy, and depth independent gas transfer. Due to their size and their lack of buoyancy, nanobubbles don't rise to the surface and provide high gas transfer efficiency despite the depth of injection. More due to their properties of surface charge, oxygen transfer efficiency of nanobubble aerators is not suppressed by the presence of contaminants. For this, nanobubble aeration can achieve nearly 100% of gas transfer efficiency. Finally, the injection of gas in form of nanobubble can provide a gas storage effect, meaning nanobubbles increase the ability of the liquid to hold gas. An independent validation performed by Professor Westerhoff and his team at the University of Arizona concluded that Moliere nanobubbles generate reactive oxygen species when those are stimulated through UV light radiation, mixing, or aeration. Generally, whenever we have forces which are undermining the stability of the nanobubbles. For this, Moliere nanobubble generator provide the unique value of high gas transfer efficiency and chemical free oxidation. In a bubble shell, we can summarize the properties and behavior of nanobubbles as such. Nanobubbles have high internal pressure and a shell of polar molecules and ions absorbed on its surface, which makes them electrically charged. Nanobubbles participate to coagulation and flocculation processes based on this surface charge. Nanobubbles interact with surfactants, they inactivate or remove surfactants from the water and can modify the surface tension of a liquid. Now bubbles show high mass transfer properties as well as gas storage capabilities. Now bubbles show oxidative, catalytic, and disinfection properties due to their ability to generate reactive oxygen species. The injection of nanobubbles within the treatment train of a municipal or industrial wastewater treatment plant can be targeted to modify the characteristics of the influent wastewater, such as the fractionation of organic contaminants, the presence of oil, grease, and colloidal, the presence of surfactants, the dissolved oxygen concentration, pH, and OROP. This will affect the processes downstream and allow to optimize the aeration efficiency through the removal of surfactants and colloidal, simplify complex molecules, which slow down the biological stimulation, producing higher oxygen uptake rate. Overall, targeting the result of maximization of treatment capacity and minimization of power density required for the treatment. Now that you have heard about the unique characteristics of nanobubbles, let's discuss some of the ways Moliere nanobubbles can be applied to wastewater treatment plants to improve plant operations and lower the operating costs. There are several applications of water and wastewater where nanobubbles offer benefit, such as improving settling and coagulation, oxidizing H2S or iron and other contaminants in the water supply, eliminating odor and septic conditions in pumping stations or equalization tanks, or what we will focus on today, pretreatment for improved secondary treatment. So how do we introduce Moliere nanobubbles to a body of water? The actual nanobubble generation takes place in a small pipe chamber where we pump water at a high velocity while injecting some form of gas. That gas can be air, oxygen, ozone, or CO2, or any other gas that may be utilized in your process. The applications and rates at which we apply nanobubbles vary depending on what we are trying to accomplish. Different conditions and goals require different approaches. While others may claim to make nanobubbles, Moliere is investing heavily on learning validating and applying nanobubbles in ways that maximize the benefits to the end user. As for implementation of the system, it is as simple as getting access to your wastewater where we can recycle it through the nanobubble generator to introduce nanobubbles or utilize existing pump flows to pass through our nanobubble generator. This can happen at a pump pit, headworks, or in the main process basin. There's little impact on the existing system and installations can be accomplished in a day. Moliere manufactures a number of sizes and versions of nanobubble generators. For wastewater, we can supply the nanobubble generator while you utilize your own source of pumping and gas supply, or we can offer a complete system with pumps, nanobubble generators, 
air supply, enhanced oxygen systems or pure oxygen systems or even ozone systems for a turnkey solution. In this case study, Air Republic Brewery were operating a membrane bioreactor as part of their overall wastewater treatment process. They were experiencing nocardia foaming, overloading and membrane fouling, all typical signs of under oxygenation. In this case, the goal was to get more O2 into the process. So we determined that a oxygen fed nanobubble generator would be a good solution. We selected our XTB 200, which is a five horsepower unit with a oxygen feed. After installing the first unit, uh, Barry Public Brewing came back and added a second XTB 200, again, five horsepower, and said they were able to eliminate the use of most of their blowers. The original setup consisted of three 25 horsepower blowers, two of which were duty, one was standby. They were later replaced with one 15 horsepower blower, which Barry Public Brewery has reported to us is primarily for mixing. They rely on our XTB 200s as the main source of O2 in their process. Following the installation of the two Moliere XDB200 nanobubble generators, the system was found to have quite a few improvements. They reduced oxygen requirements by 33%. They improved dewaterability and reduced polymer usage by 33%. The MBR process stability and reliability greatly improved. The foaming issues were completely eliminated, which allowed them to completely eliminate the use of the chemical defoamers. They increased the treatment capacity by greater than 60%. They brought up their mixed liquor concentrations to 12,000 milligrams per liter, a 70% increase in how they were previously operated. The customer was recently interviewed by a trade magazine and reported a $36,000 per year OPEX savings. That savings recognizes an ROI of just over a year following the installation of our equipment. In this case study, Moliere set out to further validate the benefits of nanobubble as a pre-treatment to the activated sludge process. Fulbright, California Municipal Wastewater Treatment Facility offered to host this testing. Initially, we ran a small flow pilot test to confirm that we could expect positive results at this facility. Based on those positive results, we then set up our equipment for a full-scale test, which would treat all of the influent coming into this treatment facility. You can see the trailer alongside their Headworks facility, which is all the equipment we needed for the full-scale uh, testing at this facility. The facility is rated for 2.7 MGD, but currently operates between 1.3 and 1.5 MGD. They're serving 25,000 primarily residential and some commercial wastewater treatment customers. Our equipment consisted of an 1800 to 1900 GPM pump with an airflow rate of 60 to 100 SCFH. That equated to an oxygen transfer rate of approximately four kilograms of oxygen per hour. So the amount of oxygen that we were injecting into the system was really negligible relative to the size of the plant. The primary purpose here is to improve the alpha factor remove the surfactants and other inhibitors, get the oxygen transfer efficiency up so that the existing aeration system can work more efficiently. We also, by going in the uh, headworks and getting into the front of the plant with the nanobubble, we improved the settling in the primary clarifier. We also improved the oxygen uptake rate of the biomass, so greatly improving the uh, kinetics of the uh, biomass in the process. This facility consists of headworks, primary clarifier, and aeration basins. The flow is split equally between two aeration basins. We injected nanobubble as a side stream in the headworks facility. Now, if this was going to be a full permanent installation, we could utilize the existing pumps to try and even further lower the uh, energy requirements of the system. But in this case, this was a test. We did run this test for 30 days. We ran 15 days without nanobubble injection to set a baseline. Then we ran another 15 days with nanobubble injection so we could establish what the uh, improvement appeared to be uh, throughout the system. In these graphs, we look at oxygen transfer rate and standard aeration efficiency. The grayed out section is the period at which the nanobubble generator was actually in operation. The solid lines are the period when nanobubble injection was being deployed. The dashed line is the baseline that was established in the 15 day period of operation prior to utilizing nanobubbles. You can see in the time periods from uh, zero to 6 a.m. that the, the two 15 day periods were very similar in, in performance. As soon as we turn on the nanobubble generator, you can see the difference in both oxygen transfer rate and the standard aeration efficiencies. 
What you can also see is after the 1600 hour period that there's residual nanobubble that has a positive effect. Uh, so we, we see some improvement even after the nanobubble generator is, is turned off. Now we operated the nanobubble generator to try and correspond to their uh, peak loading periods to try and get their best uh, bang for the buck on uh, saving them some energy. In this graph, we explore the oxygen transfer efficiency. Once again, the light grayed out area is the period when the nanobubble generation was actually on. The solid line is the period that the nanobubble injection was being introduced. And the dashed line is the baseline that was established prior to uh, running the plant with the nanobubble injection. Once again, you can see a vast improvement. Uh, oxygen transfer efficiency improved with the uh, introduction of nanobubble. And you can see once again, the uh, residual effect after the generator is turned off, you can still see that there's a re residual improvement uh, in the wastewater process on the oxygen transfer efficiency. What you see in this slide is some of our test equipment. Over in the top right is our uh, test setup that is a, a online connected device. Uh, we do have a, a small computer in there. Uh, we can continuously measure oxygen transfer efficiency. Uh, we also have a, uh, a continuous oxygen uptake rate to test set up through that system. Uh, what you see on the lower picture is the actual hood that we use for oxygen transfer efficiency. We float that over the top of the plume coming from the uh, existing diffusers. We measure the oxygen content of that uh, air coming off the process compared to the ambient air. And from there, we're able to establish what the oxygen transfer uh, um, efficiency is of the system. Uh, looking at our key findings, uh, we're able to reduce the organic load coming into the secondary process. That again is because we, we did the pretreatment at the head work, So we were getting the benefit of uh, additional settling in the uh, primary clarifier. We saw our surfactants, we were measuring QAC. We saw that uh, removed 20% uh, more then the removal the plant was able to get in the primaries without the benefit of uh, nanobubble. The actual removal with the nanobubble was in the, in the neighborhood of about 75%. Um, the, uh, we also saw a 45% uh, increase in the um, process aeration efficiency. Uh, we saw a 61% increase in the oxygen transfer rate. From the oxygen uptake rate that we uh, mentioned we were doing the testing on, uh, we saw a, an overall uh, improvement of 25% on the biomass kinetics. Uh, looking at just nitrification, uh, we saw a 22% improvement. And this could also equate to a increased secondary treatment capacity of 25%. So this technology could be utilized for lowering your, uh, your operating costs because based on this, we'd be able to lower the, uh, the uh, uh, blowers uh, and save some energy there. Or if you're in a plant that is uh, a little um, tight on capacity, uh, we could use this technology to keep everything the same way it's operating, introduce the nanobubble, and we'd be able to increase the uh, capacity of the plant. So if you've got a plant that's a little tight on capacity, this is definitely a, a tool to look at uh, for improvements there. Looking at the potential savings at this treatment plant, if you look at the bar to the left representing 100% of their current uh, energy usage, the first thing we looked at was the savings that could be achieved with the nanobubble generator set up exactly the way we tested, meaning we were using an independent pump, a air compressor, and that constituted the energy draw of the nanobubble uh, generation system. We then subtracted the amount of energy that could be turned down uh, because of the improved efficiency on the uh, oxygen uh, transfer efficiency, you can turn down the blowers. That represented a 31% savings at this treatment plant. Now, if they integrated the system into their existing pumps, we could get a further 14% uh, reduction in the pumping energy that would no longer be uh, necessary uh, for the nanobubble generation. So the end result would be about a 45% savings, leaving you at uh, only 55% of the original energy demand uh, based on the aeration portion of operating this treatment plant. In this case study, we'll discuss a pilot test which is currently ongoing. Moliere is working with an industrial meat processing plant who have a heavily overloaded wastewater treatment process. They have a permit for direct discharge to the river. The system consists of a DAF pretreatment, a basin, aerobic basin, 
final clarifier in UV disinfection. They have maximum rated flow of 3.2 MGD. We checked the DO levels prior to running the test. Their aeration basin was only maintaining between zero and 0 0.15 milligrams per liter, but far, far below the 1.5 milligram per liter they were hoping to maintain. We determined that the best location for introduction of nanobubble would be at the DAF, so they get the maximum benefit of nanobubble throughout the system. Our goal here was not to replace the existing aeration system and be the source of O2. Our goal here was to remove surfactant and other inhibitors so we can improve the wastewater in such a way that they would get better oxygen transfer efficiency, but we could also improve the activity of the biomass so that they would get better oxygen uptake and, and better utilization of the oxygen in the water. In this case, we were not able to install prior to the DAF, so we did install between the anoxic basin and the aerobic basin. Now, some of you may say, well, why would you even consider putting nanobubble in front of the anoxic basin in the first place? In this case, our goal was the elimination of the surfactant and other contaminants. We were not looking to be the source of O2. As such, we were using a very small air compressor to generate nanobubble. We were not using oxygen or some other device to focus on oxygen uh, being put into the water. Again, the goal here is to, to improve the existing system as opposed to becoming the uh, a replacement for their oxygen uh, introduction. The system that we had available to us for this test was a diesel-based Gorman rut pump. Uh, the reason for that was this client didn't have electricity available uh, to us down by the basins. And again, this is a pilot test at this time. Now that system we would consider a little bit undersized for a system of this size, considering the amount of loading that they had an improvement they were looking for. But we determined that if we ran the test, we would be able to determine number one, how effective would this be in their process? And more importantly, what would an appropriate size be for them moving forward? We went ahead and installed that system. And to date, we have the following results. After several days of operation of the nano bubble generator, just prior to the aerobic basin, we saw the DO rise to 0.7 milligrams per liter. We also are measuring oxygen transfer efficiency. We have a hood that goes over the top of one of the aeration plumes in their basin. We measure ambient oxygen levels at, relative to the oxygen level of the plume of air coming off of their process. By doing that, we can estimate the oxygen transfer efficiency. What we saw after introducing the nanobubble was an increase of almost 40%. Initially, we only saw an oxygen transfer efficiency of about 17%. We saw that increase to about 24%. We continued to see that the, uh, the rest of the month as we continued to operate the system. More importantly, we saw the ammonia drop from 1.6 to about 0.6 milligrams per liter. In fact, we had statements from the plant about having never seen ammonia levels below one milligram per liter. Uh, clearly, we were seeing efficiencies beyond the, uh, the rise in the DO. So we also did some testing on oxygen uptake rate. And again, that was consistent with the ammonia drops that we were seeing. We saw that the oxygen uptake rate had improved uh, dramatically with the introduction of the nanobubble. Uh, further on, when we got more data from the plant, uh, we also saw that their uh, fecal coliform counts following the UV system dropped from uh, what were consistently double digits, they dropped to non-detects while they were operating the uh, nanobubble. We also saw that their TSS dropped and they were getting better settling in the, uh, in the final clarifiers as a result of the nanobubble. Now this test is ongoing, we're continuing to, to run this, um, but as we uh, go through periods of uh, shutdown for some baseline and, and operation of the nanobubble, we're consistently seeing these types of results at these levels. So once again, we believe that the uh, removal of surfactant and other, other inhibitors uh, and the improvement to the oxygen uptake rates and, and the overall health of the biomass are clearly evident from this uh, pilot study. Based on the testing we've done and the case studies that we've just discussed, Adding a moliere nanobubble generation system for surfactant removal in your wastewater treatment process is an effective and low cost solution for optimizing your plant operations, reducing your O&M costs, increasing your treatment capacity. It's a very simple system for implementation. We can run a side stream and be completely independent of the rest of the operation of your plant, or we can tie into your existing pumping systems and, and show you even more 
uh, O&M savings by utilizing existing uh, pumping energy. We can work with the existing plant while you continue to operate. You can turn the Moliere system on and off as you, as you see the need. Uh, to improve your system or when you find that there's times where, uh, where you prefer not to operate it. Uh, it's a very, very flexible system. Uh, we'd be very happy to work with you or discuss any potential applications you have. So I hope you've enjoyed our discussion and we look forward to hearing from you in the near future. Thank you. That will conclude today's presentation. So I'd now like to open it up for any questions that anyone may have. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, my name is Josh Bachner. I'm the Vice President of Strategy and Corporate Development at Moliere. I want to thank Federico and uh, Peter for, for hosting and, and, uh, and giving a brief introduction. I'm now actually going to ask our panelists to turn on their cameras. And uh, I, I would encourage anyone and everyone to submit uh, any questions you may have, and I will basically moderate the discussion. Um, and one other note, I recognize that uh, a few people may have been in a separate meeting and have trickled in. So we will be sending out uh, this recording to everyone uh, afterwards. So if you did miss the intro, we will be happy to, uh, to, to send this the full recording out as a, as a post webinar uh, goodie. So uh, we're getting questions in. And again, I encourage you to continue to, to put questions into the chat. Um, a few questions. Uh, that I saw come in specifically. Um, one is how complicated is the installation of a system? And to that, I'm gonna kick this over to Peter. Uh, installation of the system is actually quite easy. Uh, as we mentioned, there's two ways we can apply the technology. We can have a, a side stream where we supply the pump and, uh, and supply the gas supply. In that case, we just need access to the, uh, to the process where we can get a, a suction and discharge line uh, connected for recirculating the uh, wastewater through our system. The other way we apply this is in line where we're utilizing your pumps. In that case, it's probably a little more complicated because we need to uh, get into your piping system. Um, but we're talking about a, a Cortec installation in your pipe system that, that's roughly an 18 inch piece of, uh, of pipe. Um, and at the point, then we just have some controls and a, uh, we would need a gas supply. So again, it's a pretty easy installation. Um, and we can do it without disrupting your uh, your process. Thanks, Peter. Another question is, how soon would we see results if we added this system to our treatment process? Um, Federico, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, we will expect to see results depending on the type of installation uh, in two different uh, aspects. One is in a matter of either minutes or hours. So our dissolved oxygen levels, our ORP levels are probably going to uh, rise in a matter of hours from the uh, installation and the operations of the nanobubble generator. Whether we should be waiting uh, a few days, maybe even weeks, to actually see a larger impact on the activated sludge. Uh, so again, two aspects. One uh, will be effective and we'll, we will be able to observe a variation in a matter of uh, uh, hours or within days. And on the other hand, uh, uh, we are expecting a longer uh, effect uh, on, on the biomass, which is in the terms of uh, several days to a week. Thanks, Federico. Um, I'm seeing a few questions that I'm going to try to basically bundle together. And I see them coming in both the chat and the Q&A. So if it's possible to put them into the Q&A section, that would help to, to just streamline this. Um, one of the themes is, and I think you started to touch on this, Federico, is will this technology be detrimental to our sludge? Or specifically, uh, said in other ways, can we inject this directly into the sludge process? Uh, yes, we can. And so far, we have not observed any detrimental effect uh, on our activated sludge. In fact, in one of the uh, case studies we've been just discussing, discussing, we were in fact recirculating uh, uh, the water uh, from the activated sludge basin. So we were injecting nanobubbles directly into uh, the wastewater containing uh, the, the biomass, our bacteria. And again, so far we observed positive results. 
Uh, I would like to add, uh, however, that we could potentially adopt this technology also to reduce uh, the amount of sludge we produce and actually enhance the stabilization uh, of, of our sludge and therefore reduce the cost of sludge handling. Uh, but that uh, would require a different, a different approach uh, and uh, we can actually size a unit to be able to achieve uh, uh, that goal. So generally, no detrimental effect on the biomass. However, this technology can be also used uh, to uh, enhance uh, the uh, sludge uh, separation and reduce the cost of sludge handling uh, in wastewater treatment processes. A few questions and comments that I'm seeing just to try to pull this together into a common theme. Andrea, can you speak a little bit more towards the quality of water that we are able to treat coming in, uh, whether it needs to be clean water coming in in order for this to be effective treatment or not? And as a secondary portion of that question, how we basically can ensure that uh, our systems won't necessarily foul with uh, material coming through the system? Sure, no problem. Uh, first off, thanks again for joining us. I, I think the, the best way to go about looking at this is the same way that you would look at any pumping system. Um, the size of the particle that can be sent through the nanobubble generator is largely a function of the size that can be uh, passed through a pump. So oftentimes we're looking at passing soft particles uh, less than three inch in diameter. Um, there are some considerations. I think I saw a question uh, related to the fouling of the system. Um, if a system sits in uh, water that's not moving and is allowed to become stagnant, you may need to conduct a CIP in which we do have um, clean in place process uh, and equipment to help facilitate that process in the event that a system does become fouled. Um, and then in terms of the water quality and, and TSS levels, uh, we do have systems that have been operating for over three years continuously on, on take for example, the uh, Bay Republic MBR system at very high MLSS, uh, up to 15,000 milligrams per liter on average is what we're able to obtain uh, with the addition of the nanobubble generator. Peter, do you wanna uh, chime in there as well in terms of uh, solids? And just to add, if, if any CIP has to take place, one of the uh, good qualities of the technology is um, we, can, we can hit pretty much any scale of pH for cleaning. So if we have to hit it with a caustic or if we have to hit it with an acid, uh, if it's needed, um, we can do that. So it, it leaves a lot of flexibility depending on what type of contaminants you might be dealing with that could or, 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 or uh, potentially could cause any kind of fouling. Um, the Cortec that we use, it, it is linear to the flow. So if you're familiar with, say, a horizontal UV system where some debris might get through a plant and it might just get around the ends uh, without affecting the, the actual process, it's similar to what's going on in, in our process. Um, like I said, we, we have seen in some basins some real stringy stuff that can get through uh, some of the eel grasses and that type of thing. And you'll see it maybe get hung up a little bit on the ends. But in general, we run a real high velocity. Uh, through our, our generator, so it just clears everything out. Interesting question uh, that I'll kick either to Federico or Andrea. Once the equipment is working, how can we tell if nanobubbles are being generated? How could we observe or test them? Uh, okay, I'm going to take it. Uh, so on one end, uh, we will see, uh, again, the effect on uh, the water quality. Uh, imagine we are injecting nanobubbles in a basin, we will see an increase in uh, uh, ORP, we will see a variation in pH. And uh, moreover, uh, we perform a routinely uh, test to assess the presence of nanobubbles, it's co the concentration and the size of it. Uh, so there are indirect methods to assess uh, that nanobubbles are in fact there, and there are also direct methods. In particular, we use uh, a nanosite, so we use technology called uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis. And anytime we go and uh, inject nanobubble in water basin, most of the time we uh, collect samples, in fact, and we run them uh, in, uh, in, our, in our laboratories so we know uh, that nanobubbles are in fact there. Um, within, in the data that uh, Peter just showed us uh, about the, the case studies we performed, we routinely uh, sampled uh, water and we were able to 
address uh, uh, the fact that the variations uh, that we saw in terms of ORP, dissolved oxygen, and the effect on the biomass were in fact associated with increasing concentration of hand bubbles. Another question that I see coming through on the chat side um, that I, I think can actually tie into a few other questions and comments is if you can go a little bit more into detail on the charge of the nanobubbles uh, in relation to coagulation, flocul uh, flocculation, and how that actually uh, may impact uh, separation processes and uh, impact on flotation or buoyancy of other uh, material. So that, I think I will kick that over to Federico or Andrea. Either way. I'll give this one to Andrea. Yeah. I can start it and then Federico can go into more detail on it. Um, so essentially, yes, there is a surface charge. So um, looking at nanobubbles more like you would look at chemistry becomes very helpful. So how you have to add chemistry um, to processes such as the DAF to get a desired effect uh, for solid separation. You can uh, manipulate the uh, water characteristic characteristics in the same way by adding nanobubbles to the solution. Um, additionally, for the um, particles or colloids and which the nanobubbles are attracted to. And um, while the nanobubbles are small and are not buoyant themselves, when you do amass enough of them around a flock, for example, you will start to see the separation. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to be solids and liquid separation either. We um, observe that nanobubbles are able to efficiently remove um, other substances such as fats, oils, and grease and assist in um, emulsion breaking. Federico, you yeah. want to expand on that some more? Uh, yeah, just uh, more generally, uh, what we have is uh, uh, for each bubble, we're going to have an uh, electrically charged uh, particle, as a matter of fact. Uh, and we can think about it as the equivalent of a coagulant. So in a DAF process, uh, what we will do is add chemistry to make sure that this electric balance is somehow neutralized so that our, uh, the chemical we are adding uh, will be going to interact with polar molecules. Uh, most of the time uh, uh, we are talking about surfactants, again, oil and grease, or more generally colloidals. And the fact that we have this dispersion, it's because of they are electrically charged. Uh, so what we do by injecting nanobubbles is we neutralize the charge of those particles and uh, that way we render them uh, um, uh, easier to actually be separated from the water by collecting them in larger flocks. Uh, question that came up that I'm going to give to Peter, uh, something that he and I talk about frequently actually, uh, that basically in, in many cases it's uh, you want mixing processes to take place and can Peter can you speak a little bit to the two different applications that you mentioned in the presentation around basically a standalone turnkey system versus going in line to not only either provide that mixing ourselves or tap into the existing jet system? Yeah, for example, we're looking at uh, stormwater EQ tanks as an application and the uh, amount of, of flow we would like to use for the, um, for the oxygen transfer just to stop it from going septic. Um, we'd like to utilize some of that horsepower for the mixing. Um, so we're right now looking at an application where we would join in with a, uh, with a um, jet mixing company um, so we can inject the, uh, the oxygen. In our case, we're just going to use air in this application, um, and they can provide the mixing, and that mixing is more than adequate for the flow we need to generate nanobubble and uh, get the effects. So essentially, for just the cost of a, a very small compressor, they're going to be able to, uh, to put enough oxygen in for a uh, 5 million, or rather 7.5 million gallon uh, storage tank. Um, what's great is the oxygen transfer is, is uh, very high, regardless of the depth of the water. So as they're filling that tank during a storm event and they only have uh, a foot or so of, of water, um, we're still getting good oxygen transfer uh, for them. And there's no additional energy. It's just the uh, mixing energy that they are already putting into the tank. Another question that goes more into the, uh, the technical equipment side of, of things. So Peter, I'll, I'll to kick this back to you as well as does our equipment require external oxygen source to accomplish uh, our goals? 
It all depends on what we're trying to accomplish. And in a lot of the case studies that we talked about today, we were focused primarily on um, surfactant removal. In those cases, it was just all air. We did not use oxygen in those feeds. Now we have other applications. We did talk about the uh, brewery application where we are using an oxygen feed and an ultimate solution for say a, a heavily overloaded industrial plant where they're struggling to get enough uh, oxygen into the water. Yes, we would probably supplement with a oxygen source, but in, in short answer is no, we don't necessarily need an oxygen source um, for the uh, applications. Uh, it can be air, it can be oxygen, it can be ozone, it can be uh, CO2, it all depends on what the application is. And some of our equipment, Peter, is uh, actually equipped with that onboard uh, air or oxygen generation itself. So we, we do have a system that can actually supply uh, that gas source directly in some in some cases. Correct. We use uh, pure oxygen generators. In some applications, we use an enhanced oxygen uh, where we need a little more. Uh, we want to get a little more uh, oxygen in the gas that's being supplied. Um, so there's a variety of, of applications and solutions we can bring to the table. Question for Federico. How is this technology applied in gold mining? Um, something that we do actually do some work in. I wanted to not focus on this, but I do want to expand the conversation a little bit. Yeah, we can uh, we can add this because it's basically one of the properties of nano bubbles that we would adopt anyway for uh, for wastewater treatment. And as we were saying, uh, something that makes it similar to the approach with uh, colloidals and physical separation, uh, we can in fact uh, inject nano bubbles in, directly in the heat bleaching. Uh, therefore, increasing the oxidation power uh, provided by the oxygen uh, or, uh, let's say, other ways of injecting uh, oxygen in our, in our heat solution, therefore increasing the ability to extract actually the gold from, uh, from the solution. Uh, on the other hand, we can also adopt this technology for side, for side stream uh, cleaning. So whenever we have for instance, a uh, disorder for flotation or a clarifier or any sort of physical separation uh, of the side stream. Um, uh, specifically, oxygen nanobubbles will be able to provide an, an higher oxidation rate compared to uh, a normal aeration system, again, because of their size and because of their ability to, to actually provide higher uh, oxidative power compared to a larger bubbles. Moreover, we have that those bubbles never uh, leave uh, the, the tank because they don't, uh, they're not subject to buoyancy. So overall, we have a much better utilization of our oxygen and therefore we are able to increase the efficiency of our uh, extraction process. Andre, a question for you. What technique do we use for the generation of nanobubbles? Sure, so all of the products that we sell are based on Molaire's patented method for producing nano bubbles. So we have our own method and own the patent on it, and all of our products are designed according to that method to produce the nano bubbles. And and that method was uh, sort of illustrated in that presentation. Um, so uh, we will be sending that out again for for people to be able to reference what that looks like. Um, yeah, it's it's. I mean, it, to be real, really general about it, it's manipulating the um, hydraulics uh, through the core technology of both the liquid and the gas to um, generate the nanobubbles. Question for both Peter and Andrea. Is it possible to replace all aeration systems and only use nanobubbles? Andrea, I'll take that if you're okay with that. Um, it, the answer is we could replace the entire aeration system. Um, whether that's the practical solution, that's the real question. Um, we don't pretend to be um, the most efficient method um, relative to a properly designed aeration basin and a properly designed um, aeration device. Now, with that being said, over at the brewery, they did replace their uh, existing aeration with our nano bubble generator. Um, we believe the best combination is supplementing with nano bubble to improve the aeration and then still utilizing an existing aeration system. Now, if you've got pumped flow coming into the system, that answer might change. If you've already got pumped flow and we can utilize that for making nanobubbles, um, then all of a sudden we're a whole lot more, um, from an operational point of view, 
cost effective. So it, it really comes down to the unique nature of everybody's treatment plan is a little bit different. Everybody's trying to accomplish something a little bit different. Um, so could it be? Yes. Uh, is it always going to be? No, absolutely not. So going into a few, few common themes here around sizing. Um, Peter, can you talk a little bit about how we would go about sizing um, the right equipment for plants? And is there a minimum or a maximum size plant that we would be able to treat? Well, right now we've tested, uh, I guess the largest test would be over at Fallbrook um, for that location. Theoretically, there's no limits on, on how large the plant can be. Um, so we, we see no, no change. We, we're, we're working on some technology where we can make the nanobubble generators extremely large. Um, and frankly, we really see no design limit to it uh, other than what we can physically build in a, uh, in, in a piece of pipe. Um, so we should be able to scale up easily. Um, as far as how we're sizing, uh, we're still learning that a little bit. Um, right now, we know we're, we're looking for um, recycle rates for some applications in the neighborhood of about three times uh, the actual plant flow. We've got other applications where we're less than the plant flow on, on recirculation. Uh, so again, it depends on the loading that you're looking at, what the application is, um, how we're, uh, we're trying to do that. Um, it, it, it's basic um, biological um, math to look at what the loading is and how much oxygen you need. And from there, we can extrapolate more or less what we uh, believe we need in uh, nanobubble injection. From there, we can do a pilot to see what your oxygen transfer efficiency is now. Um, that gives us better indication of how much improvement we think we can get. And again, we can correlate that to a, a rough idea of how much nanobubble generation we need. Andrea, a uh, question for you. How do nanobubbles compare to ozone um, and other basically AOP um, processes? Sure. Uh, so an AOP process um, generates reactive oxygen species. And so similar to if you were to combine hydrogen peroxide with UV or ozone with UV, uh, you'd be doing that specifically to create an advanced oxidation process um, aimed at generating uh, the hydroxyl radical or other reactive oxygen species. Um, so we know that nanobubbles do generate or form um, the hydroxyl radical um, upon their um, collapse or destruction and that we can stimulate that collapse. So effectively we can control a, a bit of like a dose and response, the release of the hydroxyl radical. Um, so in the same way that you look at um, adding various concentrations of hydrogen peroxide or ozone with UV to create an advanced oxidation process. You look at generating various uh, concentrations of nanobubbles in combination with UV to create an advanced oxidation process. Federico, I'm going to toss this one over to you. Um, have we used nanobubbles in a sewer network? And if so, what were the impacts on odor and corrosion? Or if it wasn't specifically a sewer network, other impacts on odor and corrosion that you can speak to? Absolutely. Uh, we actually, one of uh, our goals uh, is to actually uh, end up uh, injecting nanobubbles as soon as possible, we can say, into uh, uh, a wastewater treatment and uh, uh, in that case, uh, uh, considering the sewage system would be ideal because we are able to uh, reduce the uh, organic loading arriving to the wastewater, as well as uh, reducing the uh, gas gaseous emissions, uh, particularly from uh, um, uh, sulfurs, pretty much the formation of odors in the sewage system, uh, and corrosion as well. So we saw that by injecting nanobubbles in the influent uh, wastewater to, in, uh, to a wastewater treatment plant, we were in fact able to modify the pH and the ORP so that uh, we could prevent the formation of, uh, of gases which are um, uh, detrimental on one hand uh, to the piping because of corrosion, on the other hand are the sources of, of, of odor. Uh, so by injecting nanobubbles in the sewage system, we can, in fact, both prevent uh, corrosion and the formation of odors. Andrea, a uh, question to get to sort of expand from wastewater specifically. 
Um, question is, can you speak a little bit more towards nanobubbles and helping to restore marine ecosystems um, and tell us some examples based on same properties, slightly different application? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so we do um, have a, a lot of installations now in our surface water applications, um, spanning from um, ponds and, and lakes and other surface waters. And um, from those studies that we've conducted, uh, we do see that we are able to um, reduce the density of algae, so uh, start to mitigate and control uh, algae growth and algae blooms. Um, we're able to increase the ORP at the sediment interface with the water and in, in doing so are able to control some of the nutrient cycling. So removing some of the phosphorus that is readily available. That's uh, one of the leading cause for these algae blooms. Um, um, one of the applications that we had or installations that we had, it was a uh, surface water that was being used by a drinking water plant. Um, we were treating that surface water um, for algae and, and for nutrient load. And they also observed an improvement in their filterability at the water treatment plant. So there's a number of different benefits um, ranging mostly from, uh, it's primarily stemming from improving the oxidation or the, the ORP in these water bodies. So you'll see things like higher dissolved oxygen levels, um, but then extending beyond that to um, even improving the filterability of the water if the water is being used at a drinking water facility. Do you mind speaking briefly to uh, to expand on that, even to seabed remediation for, for aquaculture, just to, to round that out? Sure, sure. Yeah, so same thing. Um, and, and a lot of these topics are connected across uh, various uh, water applications. So, for example, in a, in a seabed, um, if you have low dissolved oxygen or low ORP levels at the um, floor of the ocean, um, that'll be an aerobic, an anaerobic condition. And that anaerobic condition is going to um, cause the decomposition or the decay of organic matter to be quite slow and low. So by increasing the ORP, by injecting nanobubbles, you can then start to have more aerobic conditions. You can have aerobic digestion occurring. And so you'll see sediment layers um, that, that consist of organic material uh, decomposing uh, more quickly to improve those environments. Peter, question for you. Can you speak a little bit more towards nanobubbles impact on flock size formation? Uh, yes, we've seen uh, introduction of nanobubble does seem to improve the or increase the size of the uh, flock formation. Um, so uh, again, I, I believe Federico spoke of the, uh, the the effects of the nanobubble are very much like a coagulant. Um, so you're going to see similar effects. Another question for Federico and Peter, probably each of you can take a crack at this. Uh, what are the data and parameters that we are monitoring? Um, there's a second piece of that question in terms of connecting to, a, to an external uh, API effectively, um, which we can probably answer offline um, as a follow-up. Uh, but just in terms of the, the parameters that you guys are monitoring, do you mind going into a little bit of detail? Yeah, Peter, I'll start if you don't mind. Uh, actually, uh, we do this uh, in uh, one end, we monitor the uh, rate of production of our nanobubbles, and that's something we can do. On the other hand, we'll be monitoring, as showed uh, from in the slides that Peter was uh, discussing before, we monitor the oxygen transfer efficiency, uh, which is basically a measurement of how much oxygen is leaving the surface of uh, your aeration basin, and uh, by that we will know how much oxygen is being in fact transferred uh, into your basin. We monitor dissolved oxygen, we monitor the airflow rate that is being supplied uh, to, to the aeration basin, and uh, we also were monitoring uh, uh, what is defined as, as the oxygen uptake rate, so how fast uh, our biomass is uh, consuming uh, the oxygen and therefore how fast uh, uh, the, the activated sludge is in fact removing contaminants from the water. And ideally, uh, we will get to the point in which we will tie all this real-time data collection to the actual operations 
of our uh, non-bubble generator. Uh, this to pretty much reduce the energy consumption to run our equipment, so to actually inject non-bubbles in the stream whenever uh, there is in fact demand. So ultimately, we would like to tie uh, our remote monitoring with uh, remote monitoring uh, put in place by the wastewater treatment plant. So they can either communicate, uh, collect uh, data in real time. And ideally, we uh, want to be able to operate uh, our non-bubble generator uh, either on demand or uh, in targeted periods uh, of the day uh, in which uh, we actually have the best trade-off between cost and benefit for our non-bubble injection. Peter, you want to add something? Sorry, unmute wasn't coming off. So yeah, we do a lot of that monitoring is uh, really more on our testing on our current systems that are being shipped. Um, we limit the monitoring to what is really necessary for that particular application. Uh, I'm not trying to be ev evasive there. The, um, uh, we can monitor just the pressure of the gas to make sure we know we have uh, gas coming in. DO is a common thing for us to want to monitor. Um, so that we know that the process is still working appropriately and we can kind of correlate to there if, if our system is also uh, working uh, properly. Um, it, I believe that question also asked about integrating that into uh, existing control systems and SCADA systems, and absolutely we can do that. Um, and we can add uh, monitoring parameters um, particular to a plant if you have specific needs. Um, we particularly see where we're going to need to tie that more, where we're trying to get an optimized um, energy consumption, where we're taking the improvements from the nanobubble generation to be able to reduce the uh, operation of the blowers. Um, so again, we, we do have a, a, a group that's working on our, um, our controls. Uh, we do have the capability of integrating that into your SCADA. So, uh, I, but again, it, it's one of those, every plant's going to have a different need. So we're right at the top of the hour. So I think we're going to call that our last question. Uh, uh, I thank everyone for taking an hour out of your day to learn more about how nanobubbles can improve wastewater treatment processes. So thank you everyone for your time and, uh, and to our panelists and uh, hopefully we'll chat with you all soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.